Uh, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us after lunch. I hope you had a good lunch break. And now to like start talks again, we have this very interesting panel about the end of programming. Is programming ending? Well, we'll see what the panel says. Uh, we have a slight change in the panelists, so I'll let them introduce themselves. But welcome. Well, thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Alex Williams, founder and publisher of The New Stack. And why are we here to discuss this topic? It came up um, when uh, Matt Welsh of Fixie.ai, he's a former Harvard professor, and he wrote an article for ACM on the end of programming. And it really sparked my curiosity as someone who's using ChatGPT. Do I even need to ask who's using ChatGPT? Okay, let me ask a question. How many people use it every day? How about twice a week, three times a week? Once a week? So like not that much, right? So, um, you know, so, so I, I'm, I'm very curious on how people, you know, view the use of ChatGPT and use of, of generative AI and other forms of AI in programming. And so the discussion is about the end of programming, but we know it's not going to end, right? We know it's always going to be here, but the question is, like, what will be the impact that it will have and what questions do you have? And so that's really what I want to get to in this discussion. And so joining us is... Bob Ben Lutz, who's with Weviate, and I'm going to ask Bob kind of what he does. And I asked Amanda Brock to join us. Amanda is uh, the uh, founder and, would you say the founder, the, the chair, the, the, the CEO of Open UK. And so maybe we just start, you can tell us a little bit about Weviate and a little bit about Open UK, because I, I want to ask Amanda, because I think there's such a story about open source and AI that we want to discuss. So maybe, Bobby, you could tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, sure. So first of all, thanks for, for having me. Um, so I'm um, Bob van Luyt. I'm one of the co-founders of Weviate. Weviate is a vector database. It's also open source. Um, and a vector database is a new type of database. Um, and it stores the vector representation coming from uh, machine learning models. So if you want to store information, or sometimes they nowadays call it like the, I guess the marketing term is the, uh, the, uh, the, the long-term memory for AI, is that you basically st store these representations in a, in a vector database. And I think one of the things that we've seen is that these databases are used kind of as the backbone in these AI applications. So last year, I think it was in November of December, OpenAI added to their website, hey, if you want to do something or you want to build ChatGPT plugins, then you can use Weviate. So that was like the first bump that we saw in, uh, in uh, usage. And now you have like AutoGPT, those kind of things, and they've all integrated Weviate as their core database. And especially because Weviate is open source, a lot of people appreciate that. So um, that's, that's growing very fast. We're now 30 people distributed all over the US and the, and the EU. So um, and we're growing. So we're hiring, so if you're looking for a job, if I may in intersect that. <laughs> sure. um, but the, uh, so that, that's what we do, and I think in a bit we can also talk about this, because with this growth of usage of these AI models, you also need infrastructure to support that, and that's what we do. We're an infrastructure company that supports storing these representations from these models. Amanda? Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Amanda Brock, I'm CEO of Open UK. I've worked in and around open source software for the last 15 years. I joined a company many of you will know, Canonical, in 2008. And I joined to work on the legal side. I was the general counsel, and I, I set up and uh, ran that legal team for five years. And then three years ago, three and a bit years ago, um, I... You can't hear me. Okay. You want to turn me on? No, Which one? You want the handheld? The yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Let me get rid of this, though. Should she use the headless or the... Yeah, no. yeah, so there we go. You've got a mic now. So, hi, I'm Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO of Open UK. We are the UK's organisation for the business of open tech. So we work with open source software, hardware, data. We bring the three communities together. We're geographically focused, but we work with everybody who is either working in that space or wants to work in that space in the UK. So everybody's welcome. We're not a pay-to-play organization. We're about bringing the community together. 
We focus on individuals, not companies. Although our funding and sponsorship comes from companies, we focus on anybody who is geographically based in the UK who wants to engage. And it doesn't matter whether you work for a UK or an international company, on your own account, whatever it is, we want you to be part of our community. I personally um, have worked for Open UK for just over three years, nearly three and a half years. We've grown massively and we have about 150 people who are pro bono or giving their time to make the organization work. Two of us are employed. We've intentionally kept the employed staff very low. We work with contractors and then we have lots of people in pro bono roles like our CTO, people who run our board, our leadership team. We have lots of ambassadors. I think there's about 10 of them speaking at KubeCon this week. So you'll, you'll see people across there. And it is a model that allows us to bring a community together to have a voice. And we, we try to represent the voice of open in the UK. And we do that in responding to legislation. We've got a new AI bill in the UK. We do it in creating policy and sharing information with government. And then we, the third thing we do is skills development and learning. So right now, we're building an AI advisory board. And we're looking for people in the UK, ideally, with skills in that space to help us to influence government around AI. And I've mentioned we've got an AI bill in the UK. We are also working on a report later this year which will look at open source and AI. So I've avoided it. I've avoided it because I think it's really hard and I don't know the answers. And now we're reaching out to community to try and work together to find the answers. Great. And one of, one of the things I like to do with the panel discussions is making it less about the panel and more about the people who are here uh, to... Uh, you know, to learn. And so I would like to just, uh, you know, start with, you know, getting some perspective from, from Bob and maybe from Amanda, but then I would love it if you would, you know, have a question or something or a thought that you have that you might share. So I'll be calling on you for, for, most, of the, for most of the discussion. Um, if you don't have anything to ask, that's fine too. We'll just keep, you know, just keep moving on. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, Bob, on, on, you know, when you think about, you know, workloads in a traditional sense, right, they always accompany a workflow, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And, I'm, and it's one of the kind of the blockers I've had with, with AI is like what is the workflow and what is, you know, what are the workloads and what is the workflow? And as a developer, how has that changed how you work? Well, I mean, so in, in the end, and um, uh, sort of like a lot of different models that we use, right? But the, the thing that is now the hype is the generative model. And the generative model doesn't do much else than make a prediction of like a, a bunch of tokens after other tokens, right? And the reason that I bring that up is because if we specifically look at that in the concept of code, it's the exact same thing, right? It makes a prediction of like um, uh, if I have a certain... Uh, a structure in, or I have a request, I have a prompt, I have a certain structure that I store the words, in this case code, after one another. Um, in my mind, when it comes to pros, that's not very different than, you know, when the whole RESTful API thing came up, we got like the, uh, the swagger and now open a, 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 uh, API definitions, and then basically you could, you know, push a button and then your API rolled out in whatever language you prefer. It's just that, but just way more sophisticated. And um, we still need to make sure that the thing that it pre actually predicts that that's helpful. So one of the things that we see the most that what people are working on is coming up with applications and tools where they leverage that prediction, but it's more the function of a tool, right? So where it helps the developer, where there's still this human creative interaction on how to structure things. So long story short, to answer your question, it is just a way to automate the workflow, right? It's like it's making it more efficient and faster to do your job, regardless if that's as a journalist or as somebody who writes code or what have you. And so, you know, if you look at the, the, the uh, evolution of open source, it's always been built on code. Mm -hmm. And which is really interesting because code is a way for, you know, for us to talk to machines, really, essentially, right? So what are some of the, the, the kind of the, the, the first inklings that you're hearing out there about AI and open source, and how does that affect people in this room who've, who basically 
you know, have learned through open source communities how they work, you know, how they how to use technologies. Where, where do we see that evolving? So I'm going to read something to you, and it's from a LinkedIn post by someone called Peter Nixie. And Peter's in the UK. I don't know him. It was shared with me a couple of weeks ago, by three weeks ago, by a friend. And it says, I'm in the top 2% of users on Stack Overflow. My content there has been viewed by over 1.7 million people, and it's unlikely I'll ever mm. write anything there again, mm -hmm. which may be a bigger problem. Stack Overflow is the repository for programming Q&A. It has 100 million users and saves man years of time and wig factors worth of gray hair every single day. It's driven by people like me. But since GPT-4, GPT it looks less and less likely any of that will happen. And this is the whole conversation, the sharing of information, the answering of questions. What happens when we stop pooling our knowledge? When it comes to time to train GPT, it risks drinking from a dry riverbed. And I've basically read you the first line of every paragraph he wrote, and there's much more detail around it. And I think there's a, a couple of things that immediately come to mind. When I, t I mean, I can't code, right? So when I talk to people who can, their immediate response is always that it's great, it gives me great information, but then I check it and I find the errors and uh, I work out what to analyze. So we have human discernment and experience and knowledge that we use to work that through. So in a way, I think it's sort of commoditization, which as a lawyer, we used to do that with contracts, right? Who wants to do 100 sales contracts that are the same? You commoditize, you learn, you pass that over to an automation. But you still, when it comes to anything clever, want that human intellect there and that discernment. So I, unless we're going to get to singularity, I think we, we will always have this need for the, the human and the skilled human. And my concern is how do we get to that skilled human in the future? You know, you're sitting here as a room full of skilled humans. How do we bring the next generation through? How does the five-year-old sitting in school right now become the 20-year-old or the 40-year-old passing on wisdom if it's all going to get into the, the machine and if that knowledge isn't going to be shared in an open and collaborative way that we're all used to? So I think we have some major issues, but I'm not quite sure how we get to the next stage or whether it's as quite as immediate as we all are making out right now. I, I, don't, see, I don't see the issue. Right, so it's like a, it's a, it's a the model it does a prediction yeah. based on the information that it that it's giving. The way that we use that information that we share, we'll keep doing that. I mean, I I run an, I mean we're we're part of this this backbone of these technologies, and I run an open source company, so I know that the information we share, those kind of things, that doesn't change. It's just feeding our creativity as humans to build things faster and more efficient. So the, the, the leap, and I'm not against AI, so don't take it that way, but the leap from here, where we are today, to the future, mm -hmm. if we are going to streamline this process through AI, how are we going to create the collective knowledge pool? How are we going to have the Q&A? How are we going to have the conversations that we have today if the answer is spat out from that and we don't keep doing that learning iterative process? How does that work? I guess it's a question about the black box. Sure, but I mean, so the, we, we, can, we can ask a question to the black box and it gives us a, a subjective or an objective answer. Um, if that answer can be interpreted as um, uh, something, you know, that, that, that comes with some form of, of interpretation, we can discuss it as humans, right? So it's like I, 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 I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that I think that the, um, I appreciate the concern, but I'm not sure if there's a lot to be concerned about because it's just a faster way. So let's take Stack Overflow. Maybe maybe Stack Overflow just um, uh, transforms, right? So that, I mean, I'm using Stack Overflow a lot. So it's like the, um, uh, maybe that there will be suggested answers. And then in the comment section, we discuss the answer that the, that the model came up with. Right, so you're looking at it, I think, more like a sophisticated search tool as opposed to the provider of an answer. Yes. So not a substitute yes. for the human. Yeah. and so just a tool. Exactly. And I think we should not forget the thing that it does is that it makes a prediction about one word coming after another word. That's the only thing it does. That's also why it hallucinates, right? So that thing that will not go away because... Um, we could have a discussion on a certain, about a certain topic, right? So, and I could speak complete nonsense, yeah. like the model does. Yeah. And I don't see how that's different than um, having like human-to-human -human interaction or human-to-machine interaction. How, a uh, question, does, are, you, are you at all, is anyone using AI in their workflow right now? 
you maybe you could tell us how and like what you've learned from it. Uh, but we need a mic. We need a mic. No, yeah. It's not a it's not a coding workflow, so it's more like uh, um, like um, what I'm looking at at the moment is like how can I get all the information that we have within the company that we have like in Google Drive, in mails, in Slack, uh, customer conversations, everything. Like how can I get this into uh, a GPT or some on top of some other model, and then how can I? you know, get answers, and whether that is on the management level or if that is on a customer uh, uh, problem level. And um, and I think I have a, a slightly different view from this, like, um, it, it just improving um, our, our own performance because like I can also see that the abstraction is so much higher like if if you look at the plugins if you see that the language model is actually um, able to understand an API and not to produce the YAML that we need to feed into the API talking directly to the API so like what if there's an alert from Prometheus coming into GPT GPT selects the right, like you have 200 EKS clusters, GPT connects to that cluster, figures out what's going on, applies a, f a few of run books that are uh, in the intranet somewhere, and if there's still a problem, then actually involves a human. So that's, that's a completely different abstraction from, from just like having a tool, a command line tool that produces some YAML on my machine to make my life easier, right? So it's the end of DevOps, not the end of programming. <laughs> Everything, like it, it's, it, you also, like you don't need to automate stuff anymore if, 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 if the AI can just connect APIs for you. Like you don't need to write the, the software that does But that right? is that is what we, that you, that I, I like that example, that use case we see so if the, your use case, if you want to store that information, that's what people use Vector Database for. And the, um, we see a lot of those kind of use cases. And in my mind, it's super exciting. It's like, it's yeah, I, I'm yeah. excited about it, it yeah. too. But still, we are talking about not only getting faster, but also replacing. Uh, like, you don't need that many people for this, right? Mm -hmm. So you need. Uh, but there will be skilled humans that are going to do that. Like a friend of mine does, does a joke. We are the, the, the ones that are working longest. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we are involving into AI and, 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 and building s uh, some tools. And other people can stop working earlier because there's nothing to do. Right? Okay, so, so but now we're getting somewhere. So, I, so do I understand correctly that the concern is that people lose jobs over this? Is that the concern? I think there's two concerns. I think there's a question rather than yeah. a concern about whether there will be a need for I humans. And then I think there is a, a question, possibly a concern, about where the AI is going to get the knowledge it needs to hallucinate in the future. Right? I like the term you use, hallucinate, because to hallucinate, you ingest something. And what we're thinking about also is what is the AI ingesting? What is it learning? Where is it getting it from? So what kind of trip is it going to go on in the future if it hasn't got anything decent to take? So what you, you say it's getting somewhere. Where, where do you think he's getting with that? Then you're talking about the data and the storage. And, but, and we're also then talking about kind of the, the, the optimization almost of workflows and processes. Does, does this optimization of workflows and processes lead to the end of programming? I, I mean, I, I hope so. It's like, it's like it's a lot of work. So it's like uh, uh, everything we can do to automate that away, it's like that would be extremely helpful. Wouldn't it be great that you can just have a description of what you try to solve? And I'm starting to see those use cases. I mean, it's very still very experimental, but especially in the front-end world, right? I'm, um, I'm trying to you know, do X, Y, Z, and then it outputs like a... Um, I don't know, a React front end that kind of solves that for you. And still it's buggy and it doesn't always work, but we see where this is going. So I would say um, yes, that, that's, where, that, that's where it potentially would, uh, uh, would go to. This is also where this thing comes from, and it's a little bit overhyped now, but where people say like, it's moving from programming to prompt engineering. Mm -hmm. Because the better you can write your prompts, the better you can get your output out, right? So, and, um, but that is, 
so that I, I mean, I hope the answer to that question is yes, because it might be extremely helpful. You could even get into situations where the system starts to optimize itself, yeah, based on certain things. So but that that's going to be not a might. That's going to have to be a necessity if we're not building humans who learn from experience year after year, trial and error, doing different things. If we become dependent on the AI for its outputs and its guidance, it's going to have to be able to do that. It's going to have to be able to have that thought process. Yeah, if we don't have the skilled humans, and we won't if they can't learn. Yeah, I mean, it's like if I, I mean, if, if we could snap our fingers or wave our magic wand and we would take very traditional databases, right? We would just yeah. remove them now. Waving our wand and Cassandra would be gone, right? That's like a database. That's how old is that? 15, 20 years? Nobody can do a financial transaction anymore. So it's like a, it's a, it, it's a necessity. It is so already a necessity, and, and, and the, the, the machine learning models are just another iteration on making that more efficient. But if, that's why I'm trying to understand really the mm -hmm. core of the concern, because if the, if the core of the concern is we're getting too dependent on the technology, then it's already too late because we kind of already are. So it's a, um, and then adding AI to the mix or not, I don't think that changes then a lot. Who has a question? Or any other, yeah, there we go. Or actually, let's go over here, if you don't mind, and then I'll go to you, Bruce, okay? Thanks. So one of the fundamental things I love about open source is um, being able to, you know, fork a project, spin something up myself, have a play with it, you know, take it for a spin. Um, with the large language models, yes, some of the fundamentals are open source, but it's essentially impossible for me or anyone else individually to train at that level and, and get something of a similar uh, quality out the other end. So are these systems now the most proprietary and closed systems that we've ever had? It's a constant question, right? And everywhere I go, people are asking me, and I, I said at the start, these are hard questions that I don't know if I know the answers. Um, last week, the European Commission, and I, I think this was leaked, um, are suggesting that AI is going to be regulated and required to show the copyright and everything it's learned from. Now, we've all been concerned about how open source licensing is going to work, how attribution is going to work, how we know where the AI has got the information it's got. And if you imagine this, in a way it's really good for open source because you'd have that attribution, you'd have that knowledge of all of the, the code that it had run through. On the other hand, you're going to have a situation where that's a huge job, right? And unless you're inheriting an S-bomb effectively with all of that data in it, how are you going to build it? And maybe there's a tool that can do it for you, maybe there's not. But potentially that's going to be a restriction for people like yourself as well versus these big companies. So I, I think we've got the actual technology. We're going to have the regulation around it. How are we going to manage all of this on an open and collaborative basis and make sure that the AI is creating the best code it can? I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, this will be resolved. Right, to give you a very pragmatic example, so um, Google Search is a very big vector database. Um, it took them a lot of money and a lot of time to build it. Right, so like you know, billions of US dollars to just build the, what Google Search is today. We're a 30-person company. We've been relying on the research that was coming out of this, so in, very specifically in our case is the ANN in, uh, index and those kind of things. And now with a 30-person um, uh, company, ex significant less amount of funding than Google, uh, Google Search has, we're now building this and democratizing it basically through open source. So um, the, I'm, the, what I'm seeing, what's happening on the, in the research and the software that's being created with these models, this, this will happen. You will be able to train this for a decent amount of money in the, in the near future. Um, because there's so much innovation happening in the, in the, in the indices, going from GPU to CPU, those kind of things. Uh, the common crawl basically is publicly a lot of software there is being created to optimize this, the, that's coming out of that. So, so the point is, if you want to train it now, you're just a little bit early, but it it will be um, it will become significant ways. And what we will see, I, I dare to place a bet for this year, we will see an LLM running on our, um, on our machines this year because I've seen so much CPU uh, uh, innovation on that. So I'll, I'll bet you a nice ball of wine and we're gonna see that this year. So 
and that will be pushed to the to the open source channels, right? So I I, I noticed that myself. So I I think there's this uh, this is not a time for uh, um, to, to potentially be worried about that, but actually be happy about it because contribute makes stuff. It's happening right now. So what's the the best uh, open source that you would recommend people in this space? So what's the best equivalent to Chat, chat GPT? Sorry, what's the, the best, best open source equivalent to Chat GPT? Yeah, so I mean, I think almost all the models that you see on. Um, uh, uh, so if you look at Chat GPT, we have to look at the model. So the GPT model that's that's behind it. Um, if you see the models that are now being open sourced on Hugging Face, it's right. like this, um, and I forgot the name, that was one that was recently released. Well, what's happening, of course, with Facebook, I love the fact that Facebook made that model uh, open and it was like on the torrent network. It's like, hey, back to torrents. That we will see that one at some point at uh, uh, on Hugging Face. Hugging Face plays a very important role as like the GitHub yeah. of these open models. That's happening, but I think there's a difference between having the model available and being able to train it yourself. Look at the fact that Bloomberg trained their own yeah. GPT model. Now you might argue, well, I'm not Bloomberg. Fair enough, but Bloomberg is also not Google or uh, um, uh, um, uh, OpenAI slash Microsoft, right? So it, it, it is already happening that it becomes easier for people to adopt these, uh, these models or, or train them. And then you can decide if you want to make... So there's a difference between... For example, you could say, I'm going to make the software open source that I use to train a model, but the model that I create, I you know, keep that as a proprietary model. I, I don't think that's a, that's a problem, because that's a way to just you know, generate money and give the, you know, give the software to people to do that themselves, and that is already happening. So okay. it's not that it's a, a, closed, um, a closed ecosystem. Bruce, I want to get to your question quickly. Yeah, yeah um, where do you see the... The actual evolution of the CLI or the, the actual interface, I mean, how's this going to change the life of the developer on a very pragmatic way? I mean... Through the CLI. It, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm also, I mean, what would you... Um, it's probably too early to say, but like two years from now, three years from now, will we, do we need programmers? I'm kind of thinking of, you know, I've always used uh, John Carmack's Sorry, what, what? John Carmack. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Of his you know, genius, genius as a programmer, right, an engineer. So we're, are we going to still need this genius? And I mean, or, or not? I mean... Well, I, I hope so, because he makes, at least for great podcasts. So the... Uh, yeah. good podcast. But, but no. I guess, yeah, but going, in, going to um, Amanda's concern, though, and it's like you have to take a step back the whole time. We got to get going, so... Okay, you'll need somebody to actually verify that. Uh, did you may I human? answer yeah, the question? Quickly and, yeah. yeah, I'll be I'll be quick. So, th two questions in there, right? A, a, a big one, a small one. So the small one is like, what will we see first? If I had to make a prediction, I, for example, if you use GitHub, you have to depend on bots, right? So the bot says like, hey, you have like a yeah. vulnerability or something, right? Right. I would imagine that one of the first things we're going to see is that the depend bot not only says like you have a, a vulnerability, but it says if you accept this pull request. I've also made the changes in your code to make yeah. sure that... So that's, that's one part of... And the second part of your question with John Carmack, those kind of people, of course we need those people, but they, 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 these roles that, that they will fulfill in society will just change, right? They'll blossom into other ways. Exactly. Like I think, for instance, exactly. my big question about open source is how will we treat biases? Like mm. how, how, you know, what's the question of biases in open yeah. source and, AI, in open source AI? I think the, the first step has to be understanding what's being used, right? So mm. that disclosure, that SBOM-like requirement is going to be the first step to understand what it's learning from. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you both for the, for the time. Let's give a big hand. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say thank you to the team who put together this great community conference. Let's give them a big hand. Rejects is the community event now, I think, for this for, for, for this space. So great job to all of you who put it together. Thank you very much and have a great have a great week.